Good evening and welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Education tonight, Tuesday, November 19th, 2019 at 6 o'clock. And this meeting is now called to order. Mrs. Smith, please do roll call. <clears throat> Thank you. Ms. Weems. I am here. Ms. Cummings. <clears throat> here. Mr. Rich. Here. Mr. Mukamal. Here. Mr. Johnson. Present. And myself here, Ms. Green. Present. You have a quorum. Thank you. Tonight we have three wonderful young men from Forest Elementary joining us uh, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. We have Graham Kosiva, Elijah, Elijah Pastor, and Felix Yesiam. Come on up, guys. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. The next item is items from the president. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Mr. Johnson. Thank you. I move the Board of Education approve the regular meeting uh, agenda as presented for today, Tuesday, November 19th, 2019, again as presented. Thank you. Support. Support. We have a motion by Mr. Johnson to approve the agenda, supported by Mr. Makamal. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, the agenda is approved. Moving to announcements. Good evening and welcome to the November 19th Bo Farmington Board of Education meeting. Our policy board governance committee met earlier this evening and an update will be presented under reports from board committees. <clears throat> the next meeting of the Board of Education will be held on December 17th, 2019 at 6 o'clock p.m. The meeting is open to the public and will be cablecast live on TV 10. The district will be closed for Thanksgiving and holiday from Thursday, November 28th through Friday, November the 29th. School will reconvene on Monday, December the 2nd. Public comment request cards are available in the back of the room. If you would like to speak during public comments, please fill out a card and place it in the ceramic bowl next to Trustee Weems. Public comments may be shared after the legislative update. Please remember to sil silence all cell phones and electronic devices at this time. In addition, out of the courtesy to those in the audience, we ask that you refrain from sidebar conversations and that if you need to carry on a conversation, that you step out into the hallway. Thank you for your cooperation. Moving to items from the secretary, Mrs. Smith. Thank you. Um, we only had one correspondence and that was from Mr. Jones, school bus driver. Communications are acknowledged and when appropriate, a response will be provided. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a report from the student roundtable president, Alexis Yunchai. Good evening, Alexis. school year, our focus is on our mental health initiative as well as better strengthening our communication with our peers. To strengthen our line of communication throughout the district, our two co-public relations officers are working on sending Google Forms to our students via their morning announcements each month to get feedback on issues that they find in their school environment. We are also in the process of distributing suggestion boxes to each of our high schools in case students want to speak sooner than our monthly Google Forms. As a board, we will then th go through all of our responses and figure out an action plan from there. Sit Around Table is also working on fundraising for local and national mental health organizations such as NAMI, Be Nice, and SAFE. Bulletin boards with information regarding resources we have on local mental health organizations and places to seek help are also being updated at each of our high schools to ensure that resources are readily available for all students. 
Another recent update is our quick overview of the student roundtable's attendance at the senior adult <coughs> breakfast. We attended this annual event and we're very glad to get to interact with our seniors and um, to answer all their questions about the transition as well. Our next event is volunteering at Goodfellows where we write thank you letters to all of our community members who have donated. Thank you for your time. Does anybody have any questions? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving to our next item on the agenda, legislative update. Mr. Rich. Sure. So uh, I guess the best way to say this is that uh, the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators gets a summary uh, roughly every week, every two weeks, uh, regarding a legislative update coming out of Lansing. And in summary of what I've been saying for the past couple meetings, here is how they started uh, with their summary. In what's becoming a familiar refrain, nothing really happened in Lansing this week. <laughs> At least nothing related to education policy or anything that moves the state closer to a resolution over the supplemental budget standoff between legislative leaders in the House and Senate and legislative leaders and the governor. And unfortunately, this House has now gone into an unofficial uh, break now that the hunting season has opened, and it's unlikely that any work's going to be done until legislators all return in December. So we're still pretty much at a standoff there, um, and they're still looking at trying to get a deal done before the end of the calendar year. However, that's not necessarily looking likely at this point. Thank you. I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, think. You're welcome for the good news. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Makes your job easier. <laughs> yeah. Our next item on the agenda is public comments. Are there any public comments? Mrs. Weems? No. Okay. Seeing no public comments. Oops. We will close public comments and move to district updates. Our first update is from the Farmington YMCA, Camp Riley, with Lauren Savage. Is Lauren here? Got it. Okay, we're moving to our next update. It would be the Farmington Farmington Hills Education Foundation update with Nancy Jennings and David Roddenkamp. Good evening. <coughs> Um, I'm Nancy Jennings, the Executive Director of the Farmington Farmington Hills Education Foundation. Inspire, innovate, invest. These are the three words that appear on the logo of the Farmington Farmington Hills Education Foundation. As an organization, it is our goal to make these words come alive for the students of Farmington Public Schools. Thanks to the support and leadership of our community, the Education Foundation has been able to fund 307 terrific projects in our school. Since launching in 2012, over nine grant cycles, the foundation has made over $347,000 in awards for these projects. Every school in our district has benefited from one of our innovation grants. I'd like to introduce the foundation's board chair, David Roggenkamp, to tell you a little bit more about what we've been doing this fall. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for inviting us to be here. Um, the foundation has had a busy fall. Thank you to everyone that supported our seventh annual A Toast to Education. It was another successful event. <clears throat> the Foundation's board and staff are deeply appreciative of the donors and sponsors that supported us and the guests that enjoyed the evening. Thirteen local restaurants donated the delicious tastes our guests enjoyed. Fourteen school communities donated terrific raffle baskets for our strolling raffle. Congratulations to all our winners and 27 district and local musicians donated their services to entertain us all evening. The event grossed just over $49,000 this year. These are resources that help support our innovation grant program. As you can see in the first slide uh, as part of the handout package, the mostly black with the blue lines on the bottom, um, the foundation has received 47 applications. You can tell it's academia. They all happen in the last couple days, right? <laughs> um, 
<coughs> and by making a joke, I lost my place. <laughs> um, so we've received 47 grant, uh, applications, an 80% increase over last year. For this cycle, the application closed yesterday um, for a total of $97,131 in requests. So these applications will now go to our grant allocation committee to make the hard decisions to align with our available resources. We hope that everyone will save the date for this year's grant and donor celebration where the foundation will publicly announce this year's grant recipients. This year's celebration will be held at Warner Middle School on February 3rd, 2020 at 5.30 p.m. We hope you will all join us. Again, there's a slide in the handout that gives more details um, about that event. In addition to this year's Atost Education and our 2019-2020 Innovation Grant process, the foundation launched the first ever official FBS Alumni Association. This launch followed months of diligent work by staff and volunteers to get to this point. Board of Education members might be familiar with the alumni directories that have been published by Harris Connect, now publishing concepts, in, for many years. Thanks to this ongoing relationship, the foundation had a substantial database to begin this new work with. Many thanks to Diane Bauman for fostering the relationship with Harris, per Harris Connect Publishing Concepts over the years. While the data existed, there did not exist a mechanism to really foster the relationships. The FPS Alumni Association's purpose is to develop these relationships to benefit the current and future students of our district. To recap where we are today, the alumni work was launched on October 15th with a survey that went to 28,506 emailable records. So emails that we had garnered through this relationship, through this process. Um, out of a total of 56,154 total students in the records. Um, so there's, a, there's a, again a slide show, talking a little bit about the methodology used um, with the Alumni Nations, which is our partner in putting all this together. Um, I have to say just personally, when I saw we just got these first blush results uh, a few days ago, and when I had my first look at them, I was, I was really amazed and surprised, when that surprised isn't the right word, um, excited about the, the information that's there and the promise that I think it holds towards building these relationships and creating uh, some living um, organizations. Um, now we'll go back on script. The Foundations Board has great expectations for how the Alumni Association will be a valuable resource for the Foundation and for the District. In this launch year, we expect for early memberships to provide for four alumni scholarships for our 2020 graduates. We have provided two slides that we found particularly encouraging. The range of years of graduates that responded to the survey and a word cloud of key words that come to mind when you think of Farmington Public Schools. So again, of particular interest, when I looked at the respondents' class years, I in my head, I expected to have some recent big spike of people, and as you trailed back in time, it would gradually taper down to nothing. It's surprisingly flat. We had a lot of respondents from many, many years ago, and we had a similar number of respondents from just a few years ago. And, you know, you, you might look at that as the glass half empty. Why didn't more recent graduates respond? But I look at it as the glass half full of we're getting a representation across all the years, which I think for an alumni organization is, is a key function. You're not just going to have a representation of one group. If we can get en engagement with all these different people, I think that's fabulous. The next slide um, is that word cloud. And again, um, I'm excited by some of the implications from the word cloud. Typically, I know we just did an engagement survey at uh, Fiat Chrysler where I work, um, kind of an employee satisfaction, and it's alarming. You get 
you know, five or six keywords jump out, become dominant in the, in the, in the uh, field of words, and everything else is tiny. Again, here, it was a much more level playing field than I expected to see. So the three keywords, which are actually kind of hard to tell because they're not so much larger than the other ones, but the three most common were community, education, and home. Again, I think very good, uh, a very good foundation to build an alumni association from. So that's the end of my prepared words. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Mr. Rich. Uh, <clears throat> two, so one question, one comment. One, I'll start with a comment. Uh, looking back over the what year did you graduate slide, I think it's extremely interesting. And, you know, we talk about the long and deep roots of this district. And we have people who graduated in 1947 responding to this survey. And so that's something that's great to see. It's people who have had this as part of them for their entire life. And so that's just a really cool thing to see. And so I uh, look forward to getting the responses from people as the years go on. The second is uh, actually a question regarding uh, some of the questions on the survey. I know uh, I've heard from a couple people uh, just regarding uh, names that they went by when they were in school versus what they do now whether that's because of marriage or a uh, change, um, whether they uh, transitioned after uh, high school, just how best to have that so that people know, okay, this is someone who I did go to school with because it might be a name that they just don't recognize anymore. Yeah. Uh, and so if that can be done in the future survey, just adding a question for that or some other way so that people don't feel excluded from the community that they graduated from. Okay. Yeah, I guess just as an, as an added comment, there, the survey was 13 or 14? 13 questions. 13 questions. Uh, obviously, you're only seeing two of them represented here. Uh, a lot of the other ones, it's a lot of text, so we're trying to work through them and figure out what the key points uh, that we could share in a future meeting might be. Sure, um, absolutely. So, so to that point, we actually did get a comment from a respondent that was around that, that issue of a different name. So we changed the, um, if you go to register, which there's no cost to register, you can register for whatever year, it now says uh, name previously went by in high school instead of maiden name. Great. So that sort of Perfect. covers whatever your circumstances mm -hmm. might have been, um, so you can give us what that name is. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. McNeil. <clears throat> so going back to the first slide on the number of applications that you received, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could comment on why the increase this year. What, what did you do differently this year that caused such a large increase in the number of applications? Um, so we we did similar things both years. The difference uh, we have found over the years, we've been doing, this is our, our, last year was our ninth cycle, this is our tenth, that depending on what's going on in the district impacts how, teacher apply, how teachers apply for grants. So last year there was a lot of uncertainty of folks not knowing exactly what building they were going to be in, and that impacted, we saw that impact our um, application rate because if you didn't know you were going to be in your room in that space the Harrison teachers not knowing exactly where they were going to be it it just it does create a difference so in years if we look at our data in years uh, which I haven't provided but I'm happy to provide in years where there's been a contract negotiation or there has been um, a major change going on we've seen a dip in applications that's been pretty consistent so it may not be that there was a huge increase this year. Might have been the last year was just a little bit lower than what we would have liked. Okay. Mrs. Smith. Thank you for your presentation. Um, and I enjoyed myself a couple of weeks ago. It's amazing to see how your program has grown and to 
um, have three daughters to go through the district and finally my youngest one was able to take part and enjoy well our daughters are the same age mm -hmm. so she was impressed to know that this is something that the district had done and um, to be able to enjoy our time with the teachers former teachers and principals um, how are the candidates know after you have given out your grants does everyone that apply get something to say that they did not receive anything everyone's contacted whether they're awarded or not awarded okay thank you okay. thank you so much thank you <coughs> moving to our next item overview of remaining 2015 bond fund proceeds um, we have Mrs. Kaminsky and Mr. Reby. Thank you, President Green, and good evening, everybody. Good well, it's evening. been a long road, but the 2015 bond is almost complete. We have about six, $6.5 million left out of the $131.5 million that was approved by the community back in 2015. $5.5 million of that six point five is from construction. Um, savings and then the other million is from technology savings so the spending plan for these dollars is to allocate eight hundred thousand dollars to central office and maxfield education center for um, a parking lot security upgrades flooring upgrades and roofing upgrades so just the basics and then secondly 1.1 million dollars for technology infrastructure student devices and teacher devices and then lastly, $1.1 million for the purchase of 10 new school buses to replace the 2005 and 2006 buses. So that's a total of $3 million. So that leaves $3.5 million to support the general fund capital needs and to complete critical projects such as boilers and chillers in the district. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reby, and it's I kind of worked alongside of you for most of the spending on this, and uh, I want to say you and, and the rest of the team did a, in my opinion, a fabulous job of making sure these bond dollars were well spent, uh, they were spent properly, and more importantly, um, based on everything that's come back, they were they came in not only within budget, but a lot of times under the budget that, that was kind of allocated. And um, I just want to say thank you very much, um, you and the rest of the team, and uh, you guys did a fabulous job. Um, but I do, I do have a question. Um, now that all of this is done, um, once this, this final part gets uh, spent, there is more money, or let me rephrase, there are mo there's more work that needs to be done on some of these buildings and other projects. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. Back in 2015, we were working with a facility study that was uh, done in 2009, 2010, and there were a lot of things that were only eight, nine, 10 years old at that time. And if you believe it or not, now it's 10 years later, so everything's 20 or 21 years old. So to extend the life of these school buildings, we need to take a hard look at our infrastructure. And one other thing you mentioned earlier, you said, uh, part of this is to replace buses from 2005 and 2006, correct? So those are almost 20, 19, 20 years old, correct? Correct. Okay. And we, so this, this would, these 10 buses will replace 41 buses out of the fleet of 95. So there's still 54 buses to be replaced over the next five, six, seven, eight years. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Motion whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, I move the Board of Education approve the. Oh, let me strike that. Hold on. Reading the wrong one here. Nope, we're good. Yeah, but you're just an update, so you're bit, okay. Yep, we're good. Yeah. My apologies. That's where it confused sure. me. Sorry. Yep, we're good. Thanks, we're good. Okay, now we're moving to action items. Correct. 
And our first action item is review and approval of the ballot language resolution. We have with us tonight Amanda Van Dusen from Miller Canfield, who has worked with us previously and very well aware of our district, as well as Mrs. Kaminsky, our Assistant Superintendent of Finance. Good evening. Good evening. So I'd like to introduce Amanda Van Dusen from Miller Canfield. She served as our bond counsel for many years in the district. Um, and she is here to um, go over the resolution to submit a bond proposal um, and also the ballot language uh, to, to put um, a, on the vote, uh, on the ballot, sorry, um, on the March 10th, 2020 election date. So I will turn it over to her. Thank you, and it's very much a privilege to be here tonight. Um, and uh, I'll just take a moment to um, walk through the resolution because that is really quite straightforward. Um, it's a determination that it's uh, necessary for the health, safety, and welfare of the district to finance improvements, which you have, I know, been reviewing uh, uh, at great length uh, in the district, which are described in the ballot. Um, and that it's necessary and desirable to borrow the sum of 98 million, it's a not to exceed number of 98 million dollars in issue bonds for the purpose of paying for the cost of the projects. Um, and then it expresses an intent, it's not an obligation, it is permission uh, for the board to authorize the issuance of the bonds if the voters approve the ballot proposal in March and if you issue the bonds, that would carry with it an obligation to levy a debt millage in an amount necessary to cover the debt service. And that's, you're voting on the bonds, not the millage rate. So the millage rate necessary to cover these bonds will actually fluctuate. But when I get into the ballot, I'll explain what the overall impact is. So in order to place the proposal on the ballot, we need to approve and certify the language to the county clerk no later than 4 p.m. on December 17th, which is two hours before your next board meeting. So that's why we are here today. Um, it used to be much more complicated uh, for the district to um, run an election, but you are out of that business. So the only step you have in connection with this election is to certify the proposal to the county clerk by December 17th. And um, other than that, we would encourage the district to review the proof of the ballot before it gets published because it's your ballot. Um, the ballot itself, um, which is at your place, and I want to point out one small change that, um, that we received after you um, uh, uh, received it, before this went into your, after this went into your board packet, it has no impact on the wording of the ballot. But I'd like to walk through the ballot, and when I get to that change, I'll point it out uh, to you. A lot of this is set by state law. So the lead-in, shall the Farmington Public School District County of Oakland, Michigan, borrow the sum of not to exceed $98 million and issue its bonds for the purpose of paying the cost of making the following improvements? It's pretty boilerplate. Then we have five, five bullet points that describe the improvements. This is very important because it defines the universe of projects that you can do. It's, if we don't describe a project in this ballot, you're not going to be able to do it. Your pro so in preparing the ballot, we have scrutinized very closely the scope that you've been working on uh, for these many months. So it covers a lot of remodeling expenses. It covers some additions. It covers equipping, furnishing, and we say those two things plus re-equipping and refurnishing because equipping is putting in new, re-equipping is replacing uh, existing equipment with new equipment. The same thing with furnishing and refurnishing. And then we indicate some of the broad themes that showed up in your, um, your scope. But really, you can do this kind of, re you know, these are just examples, but not an exhaustive list of the types of improvements that can be made. We also pick up uh, the development of sites 
That's why if you're demolishing anything, landscaping your parking lots, all of those kinds of things. And outdoor athletic facilities, playgrounds and structures, school buses, as Mr. Raby mentioned a moment ago, and acquiring and installing technology infrastructure and equipment. So that covers all the devices and any wiring, servers, all of that kind of stuff. That's the end of the question, but it's not the end of the ballot. And state law requires us to include all but the first sentence of uh, the following paragraph in the ballot. But we add in the first sentence, which is voluntary, because frankly, I think that's what gives context and helps a voter understand what the impact of this ballot proposal might be on them. And these are projections, but the district has worked very hard to structure uh, a bond proposal which using the conservative estimates of your financial advisor, because you'd rather be too conservative than not conservative enough, is that it's expected that the debt millage rate will go down, in this case, from the 3.3 mills to 3.2 mils, uh, and the 3.3 being the existing levy, uh, which is 0.10. It's a tenth of a mil less than the 2019 levy. The rest of the sentences are absolutely required by law, and it's there, this is where the change has occurred. The estimated millage rate to be levied in 2020 to service this issue of bonds is actually 0.9. The, the version in front of you says 0.91 mill. That's just the first year levy. It's the component that, given the assumptions and the numbers that the financial advisor has run, it's estimated that your first year levy on just the new bonds, the first series of the new bonds, would be 0.9 mills. The draft that you have says 0.91. Now, we could probably leave the 0.91 in, but uh, the new numbers that the financial advisor gave me uh, showed the point nine, and I thought we might as well ask you to make that change tonight. The next sentence after that, or actually the next part of the, that sentence says, the estimated simple average annual millage rate required to retire the bonds of this issue is 1.12 mills. I don't know really if that means much of anything to anybody, but we are required to include that in the ballot. And then this last sentence in that paragraph just said, indicates, as you plan to do, that you'll be issuing the bonds in more than one series, and that each series cannot exceed 20 years in length. All the numbers in this paragraph, except that last one, the 20 years, are estimates, um, and will depend on the interest rates at the time that you actually issue bonds, when you actually issue bon the bonds, and what your tax base it looks like at that time. Uh, the 20 years is a binding number, and this is again based on the numbers that the uh, financial advisor has prepared. The final sentence in the parentheses at the bottom is not required by law, but every single one of our clients and the state of Michigan loves this sentence because it's absolutely true. It indicates that under state law, Bond proceeds may not be used to pay teacher or administrator salaries, routine maintenance costs, or other district operating expenses. The proceeds of the bonds have to be used just for capital expenditures. So with that, if you have any questions, I'm delighted to answer them. Uh, and any ask anything else about the uh, election process? Motion first. Move the Board of Education approve the resolution to submit bond proposal for the election date of March 10, 2000, of 2020, as presented with the 0.9 mil as presented this evening in replacement of the 0.91 and waive the reading of the resolution. Support. We have a motion by Mr. Johnson to approve the resolution to submit the bond proposal for the election date of March 10, 2020, and waive the reading of the resolution supported by Mr. Rich. Discussion? Mr. Rich. Sure. Uh, I just want to bring up that this is 
the product of a great amount of work done by our administration and our finance and facilities committee. So that's myself, and Ms. Weems, and Mr. Johnson uh, going through what puts our district in a good spot for looking into the future and not just a what are we doing for the immediate short term. And we were able to look at it as, um, as was mentioned for uh, in the ballot language, that it is that uh, 0 0.1 mil less than the 2019 levy. And that's all stuff that we were considering as part of the committee. And so I just wanted to thank everyone who's been involved in that process in getting it here so far. Mrs. Weems. Um, just want to echo uh, Mr. Rich's comments, completely agree with what you said, and appreciate your comments. I think people definitely expect us to be forward thinking, and uh, I think we are being forward thinking here. This is a bond that we need um, in order to support our students and our schools uh, for the future, and I'm really happy that my colleagues agreed to give some thought to the $98 million. Uh, which gives us the, the room I believe we need. I'm fully supportive of that and also uh, recognizes and appreciates uh, from a community perspective a decrease uh, that is expected in terms of the uh, millage reduction. So um, I think this is a good result and I'm fully supportive. Mr. Johnson. Um, again, thank you, Mr. Rich, Ms. Weems. It's been a pleasure working with you. I, I want to say something about this and I, I want to go back to Mr. Reby's comments earlier and I hope everyone listened to what truly needs to happen this community gave us monies prior to this 131 and a half million to um, take care of the business of the schools and as the presenter mentioned um, none of this goes towards um, any salaries of teachers administrators etc We've got buses that are old that need to be replaced. We've got buildings that need to be fixed. And we have been doing that with um, the monies that have come forth. And as Mr. Reby mentioned, there's still more work to do. Um, I believe Ms. Weems said, said it eloquently that, you know, the money that we're asking for is what's needed. Um, you know, we're not Ann Arbor. We're not asking for a billion dollars. Yes, they did pass a billion dollar bond for schools. Um, we're asking for 98 million because, again, um, young kids like in the front row here who are Boy Scouts and they're Girl Scouts and other folks, we don't want them going into buildings that are unsafe simply because we can't afford to fix the roof. Um, I hope I, I've gotten a lot of calls regarding this and the this money, and people are saying, "Well, we just gave you some." Yes, you did, but again. You know, we've got uh, many buildings in this community, many parking lots, buses, and other things that need replacing. And the <laughs> monies were spent properly before, and this community will, or this board, I'm, I'm sure, will continue to spend it properly for the things we need. Um, and I'm stressing need. So I, too, will be um, supporting this because it is a need, um, not a want. So. Thank you. Mrs. Cummings? Um, well, I'll echo uh, what has been said. <laughs> I do appreciate all the work, uh, the thought, the effort that's gone into it, into this, and I do appreciate the detailed um, summary of, of the language. I think that's very helpful, uh, not only for the board, but for the public. Um, and we had a special meeting. My days run together. That was last week, I believe, and so, um, um, I believe that was recorded, and so that should be uh, um, online and available for anyone that has questions and, and wants a little more detail. We did uh, run through this in a special meeting. Mm -hmm. Was that last Thursday? Last Thursday. Last Thursday. Thursday, whatever date that was. So, um, so information's out there, and of course, any questions. Um, uh, I think dialogue is important, and communication is mm -hmm. important. But truly, these are needs. Um, you know, think about owning a home and the to-do list that you have and the things that need to be fixed. Um, we're talking about a district with 
Um, how many square feet is it? Two million. Two million. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought I, I recalled <coughs> uh, Mr. Reby saying last week. So two million square feet. Um, it's, it's, we're going to have some upkeep there. We're going to have expenses that, that go with the two million square feet. Um, and we want our buildings to be presentable, safe, um, and ready for students to come in and learn. Um, so I, I, I'm very glad we're moving forward with this uh, bond issue for March. Thank you. Mrs. Smith. Um, thank you, Ms. Green. I'd like to also echo all of my colleagues and thank you to the committee that sat down and worked and got this together. Um, I echo the same comments. These are not wants. These are needs. Um, to hear that we've got the buses um, that are almost 20 years old and we need to have the safety and the well-being of our students. Um, we have three young men sitting in front of us that would expect us to do what's right for them. Um, they can't stand up here and fight for this and ask for it. So who better can? It's the community, this committee, and our superintendent and his cabinet. And thank you to Mr. Reby. Um, I also support what my colleagues have put together um, to get this done. Um, as Ms. Cummings said, when you have a home and you purchase a home, you don't let the cabinet doors fall off <coughs> and just keep walking. You fix the cabinets because who knows later on you may want to sell. So in this case, we want to keep those cabinets and those buses going for our students to have. So thank you. Mr. McAmel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to thank the committee. Uh, for doing all of the work that's required to come to this point and certainly um, <coughs> Ms. Reby, Mrs. Kaminsky for you. The point I want to make is that I served on building site and safety last year and actually one of the reasons why I wanted to serve on the board was to be able to look at how the money was being spent on bonds, taxpayer money was being spent and the thinking and process that was going behind that. I was, I walked away very impressed at the level of thought that went into every aspect of how we do bids, uh, how uh, contractors are selected. The process that is used, I can assure the public, was very thorough, that it's treated very seriously that we are very mindful of the fact that we are spending the public's money and we are entrusted to do that in a very responsible manner. So I'm very satisfied with the quality of the process that is being done so that when we put these things out for bid in the future that, it, that the people's money is going to be very well spent. So I'm very supportive of this bond as well. Thank you. I also will echo the comments um, and um, Mrs. Weems comment on forward thinking. We've talked a lot about maintaining our buildings, um, getting them up to speed and making sure we're, we're keeping safe, secure facilities for our students to grow and learn in. But we also talked about how we have to get them to school in a safe manner by transportation. But we need to talk to the other piece of that bond is that technology piece that we must maintain current and relevant technology for our students to be able to be competitive as they leave our schools and go into the marketplace, that they have the technology in our schools that they need uh, to have those skills. I also want to thank the committee and Paul Wills from Plant Moran mm -hmm. Presa to, for the time he took to make sure that we as a board understood every aspect as we had many questions. And I also want to say that I look forward to um, and want to thank the previous bond oversight team um, and committee from the community that helped oversee that, um, how the bond was handled. And I know that facilities and our finance committee will be looking at implementing a new team to oversee as we move forward as well. So um, we'll continue that same structure. So I also am ex very, very supportive of this as we move forward. Thank you. Seeing no other discussion, um, Mrs. Smith, will you please do a roll call vote? Ms. Cummings. 
Yes. Ms. Weems. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Mukamal. Yes. Mr. Rich. Yes. I myself, yes. Ms. Green. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is the approval of the summer tax collection resolution. And we have Mrs. Kaminsky. We'll just have a hold till motions made if there's any discussion. Mr. Johnson. Will the Board of Ed approve the summer tax collection resolution as presented and waive the reading of the resolution? <clears throat> we have a motion by Mr. Johnson to approve the summer tax collection resolution as presented and waive the reading, supported by Mrs. Cummings. Any discussion? Thank you, Mrs. Mrs. Smith, roll call vote, please. Ms. Weems. Yes. Mr. Rich. Yes. Ms. Cummings. Yes. Mr. Mukamal. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. I myself, yes. Ms. Green. Yes. It passes. Thank you. Moving to discussion items, policy updates. <coughs> um, first reading. Mrs. Wings. So, um, as a reminder, the policy committee received several policy updates that were recommended from our attorney, Luskin Albertson. Um, this will be the first reading of those. It's on page 50, if you have it printed out. I'm not sure what page it is. If you're, yeah, it's on 50 as well, mm -hmm. online. Uh, so what I'd like to do is read through each of these and provide an opportunity to make some comment. Most of these are straightforward. Some of these are required by law, and some of them are just recommended uh, updates to wording just to conform to uh, suggestions. The first one is with regard to our bylaws and conflicts of interest, and it's really just to um, recommend a change to remove the term newly elected such that it will read, uh, a conflict of interest involves a member of the immediate family of a board member is already an employee of the school district. Such board member shall abstain from voting on any matter affecting the employment status of the employee. Are there any comments with respect to that one? Yes, Mr. Mr. Johnson. A um, little concerned about a, a this one, and, well, this one and a few others, but specifically this one, when we say employee status, I'm not sure, A, what we're referring to. Does that mean a uh, promotion or what? I would like to see that a little clearer. So I, I know, like, I'll use Mr. Mukamal as an example. I know when it comes to contract negotiations, he does not, um, does not, vote on those or, or really put any input because of his wife's position. That, based upon this, would not have anything to do with that because that's financial gain, not status. So I would just like to see that, if we were to go by this, I would just like to see that cleared up a little bit more or either, you know, status or pecuniary interest or something along those lines. So. If I may, Mr. Um, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying, no, no, no. based on, no, I think because I, I think the the point um, here is is that the board anything from which a board member may materially gain as a result of having a spouse as an employee in the district, that board member shall should refrain from voting. The, and and right. it should it should say that. Specifically, it, like that, right? As opposed to the employment status, yeah, which I, may I, be more limited in scope, is that? Yeah, because I, when I think of employment status, that means like if your wife is uh, potentially getting moved up to principal, well, that's employee status. Right. That has nothing to do with pay. That has nothing to do. It, to me, it, it just says position. I would. This is maybe it's just me, but I what you just said is is clear and direct. And if that's well, the thank purpose. you, and I'm not even a lawyer. <laughs> so what would you suggest it say, Mr. Johnson? I, I like what Mr. Mukamal just, what just yeah, stated. Yeah, voting on, on any manner 
um, in which the the board member stands to materially gain? Um, that would require us to define materially gain. So why don't we take that recommendation back to Luskin Albertson mm -hmm. and see what suggestions they come up with? I would because my con whoops, sorry, I need to take order. Sorry, Mr. Rich. Go on to Ms. Cummings and come back to me, please. All right, Mrs. Cummings. I have a question regarding the language where it says of a board member is if a member of the immediate family, then parentheses, <coughs> of a board member is already an employee of the school district, sh can we just take out is already? Because if, uh, let's say, a board member's um, immediate family member is hired in to the district, um, yeah. that, then it wouldn't apply to them. Mm -hmm. so. I think that's a great suggestion. We do, however, have a separate policy which okay. precludes. And that was my question, yes. is was, is there right. a separate yeah. or There okay. is a separate policy, but we could, we could definitely take that out. But the, I think the point of this one is um, to the extent there is a new board member who is either appointed or who wins an election, their um, spouse or family member is grandfathered in essentially but a sitting board member is not allowed based on our current policy to have an immediate family member be hired that's the way our current policy reads okay that's correct which is something we're going to get into oh, later right yes. I, I was going to say okay <laughs> i have <laughs> questions well, about that yes, as well that, so. that's a separate yeah. question and okay. it's one that the policy uh, committee is ta it will take a look at but that's our current okay. policy because there might be I other the same look issues the yes. <laughs> right there might be other issues with that um so i'd be really interested to know what our attorneys um have sure. to say about that um so, okay i'll leave it there and i think that's one of the challenges your committee is facing mrs williams is that making sure our language is consistent through our policies mm -hmm. so our policies don't conflict with one another in language, much like what we just experienced as delegates with MASB having to clean up so everything yep. aligns. So it's currently aligned in that a newly elected, which is why it used to say newly elected board member, um, has a family member who is already mm -hmm. a, right. an employee of the district, you know, has to abstain from a vote essentially where there's a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. This is coming. And I understand where, the, where this mm -hmm. is coming from, and just um, so the public's clear, our policies did recently change. That's why mm -hmm. this, you know, going through this yes. is a little cumbersome, perhaps, yes. but <laughs> yes. worthwhile. And why, you know, we may not be sure. You know, was that an old policy? Is that now our new policy? Um, and so it makes sense that you're going through. And I do appreciate the work the committee's doing because I know this is, this is time consuming <laughs> and. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. Most certainly is. Um, so we will take this one back. Thank you, and that's why we have so many readings. Uh, the next one is 6.2, and this one is um, a suggestion based on a change in uh, the law. Gatsby Statement number 84 may change the way school districts handle and report student activity funds, among other things. So to ensure compliance with GASB 84, they're recommending an addition of the um, change to the fundraising subheading such that the reading under fundraising uh, would state that this administrative regulation does not apply to fiduciary activities as the phrase is defined under GASB 84. I will move on to the next one. Uh, this next one was not is not being recommended by the committee. Uh, I will read it and give you um, some uh, background as to where our committee landed on this one. So the first two are recommendations. For this third one, it involves food deliveries and the suggestion from uh, the group that does our policies is to prohibit students from ordering delivery food during the school day. Um, either from a restaurant, Grubhub, um, DoorDash, those types of things. Um, we believe that, and, and violations of this policy might result in student discipline. We were 
hesitant to adopt a policy that restricted this at this time because we're not clear as to whether this really is a problem in our school district and we'd, w we'd want to get uh, more insight from our building principals um, and administration there to see whether that was something that was an issue uh, which would necessitate creating some policy around it and want to avoid creating policy just for the sake of p creating policies. Um, this is Cummings. Um, I'm, I'm curious. I think this is a question for Dr. Herrera. Um, what I've witnessed, what I've seen over the last couple of years is our building administrators uh, handling this issue. Um, is this an issue that we can put into our our building administrator's hands and, and say they know their buildings best, they knew, know their students best, and they can set the policy, uh, which I would hope would be consistent uh, among our schools? Um, or does this rise to the level of needing a, a, a board policy at this time? Well, certainly if you, if you have a board policy, then it's very clear on, on what direction we'll head with our code of conducts and our student handbooks and guides. Um, if, uh, if, if the policy doesn't exist, then I, I think, you know, we do need to work with our administrators. As you know, we have the code of conduct coming through um, to the board here within the next month for review. And then we'll begin to implement the code of conduct shortly after the holiday break in certain phases. So I, I think that's just, you know, discussions we have to have as, as you know, our environments change, as technology changes, as a, you know, services changes, change within a community. So, um, you know, I would, uh, I, I certainly feel comfortable, you know, thinking that our building, or believing that our building administrators can handle this, um, you know, on their own and accordingly to make sure that the environment stays orderly and, and we don't have a large amount of traffic, foot traffic coming into the building throughout the day. Um, and I think that's the biggest concern is to, to what level this would dis disrupt the, the building environment or the learning environment. But, um, but I, I think this is, you know, I think, um, as Mrs. Weems said, this, this may be more of an issue in other districts right now. We haven't experienced it, at least to my knowledge. Um, so whether the board decides to be proactive on this and anticipating that we're going to eventually have, <laughs> have issues or whether you'd like us to use our discretion at this time, um, we're, we're willing to work both ways. But I think, we'll, I think we are, have a common understanding of, you know, what, what our limits would be on this and when we would begin to address it. Follow-up, just quickly. Um, so I'd be curious to know from our building administrators, what, because I, I have seen communications on this, which leads me to believe that okay. the issue has come up, uh, and, unless that was just administration being proactive, or school administration being proactive. Uh, so it might be worth an investigation to, to figure out what is going on. So we can find that out. Mr. Johnson. Thank you. I, I understand the intent behind this. I, I would be careful, just one man's opinion. You know, so you talk about these places like Grubhub, DoorDash, Uber Eats, not to single those folks out, but what if I wanted to order Pizza Hut? There, are they now a delivery service mm -hmm. or, but actually what this says to me is this is someone else going to pick that up on behalf of Pizza Hut, whereas Pizza Hut is the actual delivery if they're bringing it themselves. It says either from a restaurant directly. Or so this through would, smartphone. This okay. would include Pizza Hut deliveries and, and Hungry Howie's perfect. and Little Caesars, all of that. Okay, and, and the only other concern I have would be if this is the case, we have to be careful because no offense to our teachers who work hard, some of them do this when they don't have a chance to get lunch. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like to see a policy that would affect the entire, not just the students, but the entire body. So in other words, if the students can't do it, I don't think it's fair that in something like this that we look up and say, hey, the teachers are doing it, you know, so just my two cents. So it, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mrs. Smith. Trustee Williams, we do have two high schools, but we also have an alternative school. That school community is, they don't have access to the lunch rooms that our other high schools have. So if we did look into this, I think that it should be under, like you're stating and everyone is st stating, the discretion 
due to the fact that those students don't have access to go into a lunchroom as the other two high schools do have, and they do have deliveries. So how would we address that issue? As usually well? in an alternative setting, um, the students aren't ordering. Usually the staff is ordering on behalf of mm -hmm. the students. So right. they say, okay, we're going to order from such and such place today. Who wants what? And then we make one order, and it's one delivery. So it, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of traffic coming in the building. Right. So um, so this this wouldn't particularly prohibit that. But but I you know if the board feels... I would feel more comfortable um, giving some feedback from our, our frontline administrators. I'd be happy to pull them and then bring that back for further dialogue at committee. Thank you. I just want to also add not just the teacher component and the student component, but sometimes parents will order to have the lunch delivered in, so we need to make sure we're covering because I wouldn't want to see a child disciplined because a parent or a relative sent in a lunch. Um, for something like that so so I think the board is bringing up a lot of great factors which is kind of why the policy committee decided this was yeah. not ready <laughs> right, right. for recommendation to the full board uh, moving on to 6.4 uh, which 6 is 6.04 thank mm -hmm. you um, this one is being recommended to comply with uh, MDE's model medication policy and it's adding that approval is needed by the superintendent and signature by both the parent and the student's physician in order to administer prescription or non-prescription medicine um, in the building. Pardon? It, it, I'm sorry. I was just, what you were saying and what I was reading here yeah. says form approved by superintendent. Yeah. Yes, and signed by both the parent and the student's physician. Right. Did I say that wrong? You did. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. All right. That's fine. You said signed by superintendent. superintendent. Oh, I apologize. Parent and physician, a, a, but the that's form okay. needs to be approved by the yeah. superintendent. Mm -hmm. Just a, a quick reminder to the board that the the policies are stated here, and then the administrative regulations, which are not really part of policy, but part of our administrative guidelines, right. are. You know, just so you know that they're mm -hmm. not actually going in policy, they were going in our administrative guidelines to align with your policy. So just correct, correct. make sure you understand that. Good point. Um, those that would not be outlined in your policy. Yeah. This next one, 6.05, would be this first section on um, curriculum, and so there's a sentence being added or changed at the at the beginning and also at the end, and it just clarifies that the board directs the superintendent to develop, implement, and provide ongoing evaluation of the school district's curriculum and makes clear that any changes to the curriculum must be approved by the board. Moving on to 6.06, .06, this uh, one on medical examinations is being um, recommended to comply with federal law. And essentially, it is providing that the superintendent or his or her designee may require an employee to submit to a medical examination when an employee has provided insufficient medical documentation as the basis for a health leave, and after providing the employee an opportunity to supplement the documentation, the documentation remains insufficient. That paragraph was similarly worded, but this is more um, distinctive. Mr. The Rich. Oh, I <clears throat> I just think since it was mentioned in this past one and I just wanted to get it re-upped in people's memory and thoughts on this is we do have a lot of his, her language in our bylaws uh, throughout our district and just the thought of shifting more into a gender neutral singular they instead of the his slash her um, and wanting to see that across all of our policies. I know that's a lot because we have a lot of, uh, of language literature out there, but that's definitely something I'd like to see in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this next one is 6.08, and it's on business. This change really just acknowledges the formal, former GASB. Um, which was superseded, and I think here they're just going to refer to the most recent GASB as opposed to having to change the number all the time. So, uh, in fact, it, it, it goes on to add um, wording that says the most recent applicable GASB requirement. Um, this is coming. 
did you mean to skip over 6.07? <coughs> I did not. Thank you. It, there's a lot of words on the page. Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Yes. Cummings. <laughs> um, update 6.07 is made to uh, conform to a new Michigan code, and so the Code of Ethics now refers to um, that it's including the Michigan Code of Educational Ethics. Thank you, Mrs. Cummings. Moving on to 6.09. Uh, this policy is just being updated to add fixed assets to the, to add vehicles to the fixed assets policy. Uh, previously, it was not singled out. That is the only change being made to that one. Moving on to 6.10. Um, this one has to do with uh, checks for volunteers. Uh, a number of school districts have recently expressed concern over the lack of knowledge they have surrounding in the criminal history of people who may volunteer in buildings. So there are some, this is, this is a, actually a, um, a policy I don't believe that we currently have now, so it's recommended as new, around uh, background checks being required for all volunteers. Mr. Johnson. Um, <clears throat> I completely understand the reasoning behind this. However, I am concerned about what they're using here. Um, reason being, if you look at this particular statute, it is for, um, it's specifically written for teachers who hold certificates. So for example, if a teacher gets a DUI, um, which is a misdemeanor, um, their certificate or their opportunity to teach goes away. If we adopt this, this along with some other listed misdemeanors in there, um, I think, you know, I believe, and I, I would have to double check on this, I think even open intox in a vehicle, uh, which is just a 90-day misdemeanor, not a 93, that would potentially prevent someone from volunteering. I think Again, we're not talking about teachers in this case. We're talking volunteers. And this statute or these statutes that, the, uh, that are referred to here are referring more so to those who are in the classroom every day. And I just don't know that that's necessarily fair for someone to I think you bring that. up a good point. And the committee spent a lot of time on this one. We did talk about, um, you know, instances where parents perhaps uh, had misdemeanors and we were concerned about whether you know parents might be precluded from volunteering in their uh, children's classes um, it, it's not all misdemeanors it is misdemeanors that are listed uh, offenses and I don't have the full inventory of misdemeanors that are listed offended offenses but it might be helpful for this board to have that and so we'll provide that at the next reading um, the other thing uh, to note here is that there is some flexibility here with respect to um, the superintendent and the board being able to approve volunteers um, that uh, don't meet the requirements. So if there were some extenuating circumstances, um, if the board and the superintendent wanted to allow a particular person to volunteer who you know, didn't meet the criteria, that were possible. And so with those caveats, the, the committee thought it was um, okay to, you know, recommend this one to the board. And just and my only two concerns, one with that, now we're making exceptions. So if I do it for person A and I don't do it for person mm -hmm. B, I think we open ourselves up to mm -hmm. things we don't want to be opened up to. The iChat portion, iChat is not a very good tool. There are lots of things that get through iChat, um, and iChat is more of a Michigan, uh, it's a state of Michigan, state of Michigan. tool. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if, in fact, we can have them do a criminal background check at, um, at their own expense at the local police station. Um, you know, let them submit to lien <coughs> and, you know, go from that standpoint, get a clearance from there, because lien is... Um, 
very comprehensive and we know what's there. I know people, I've represented people, as a matter of fact, that I know for a fact have felonies, but you pull them up on iChat, it's nowhere to be found. So I, I just want to make sure that we're using a proper tool to vet the folks that are coming into the schools. So, Mrs. Cummings. Um, so two things, I'll start with um, what's fresh in my, in my head. Um, so uh, I agree. I think we need to make sure we're using a um, thorough and reliable tool. Um, I would have concerns <coughs> about having volunteers have to go somewhere and go through a, a, um, uh, more steps um, because currently my understanding, this is the second question I has, currently my understanding <coughs> is we, we do have a policy, and again, policies changed recently, Maybe this was and now it's not, but my understanding is that currently there is a policy that volunteers do have to apply and go through the check on, a, on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think going through um, something such, such as lean where they would have to go and take additional steps on an annual basis <laughs> um, might be a bit much to ask for our parent volunteers who do give so much of their time, but obviously we we want to make sure that we are doing some type of check. So I think we just probably need a lot of um, uh, some more information so we can have those questions answered. Um, I was going to say that um, my knowledge, too, is that although we have this policy and we use the iChat, um, I think it's really important that we do do an annual, whatever it is we decide. But I think that um, knowing some other situations in other districts um, and where it, the language in their policy does not say board and superintendent, superintendents have given some waivers um, and it's set the, the community up for some problems. Um, so I think that's important language. So I'll give you an example of something that I knew from being in our system. If you say destroyed an ice shanty when you were a youth, uh, and it was $500 or more, you had that on your record and you were prohibited from volunteering in our school unless you received a waiver. So that's where the language gets, where you've got to look at some justification for some opportunities. Um, urinating in public while you were in college um, can also prohibit you. So we have to have some type of language that looks at some of these things and that factor in a way to, to vet some of those things out. If it's 20 years old, you know, you're right. If it's 20 years. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's so so these are good comments, so the committee will take this one back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 6.11 is an administrative regulation, so we will skip that one. And I believe that is it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well done. Okay, moving to our next item on the agenda, items from the treasurer, Mr. Rich. <coughs> I just wanted to make sure that we didn't miss anything. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I do think we have one more. Do you have one on more? On 62. She has one more. Yeah. Let's update to regulation 7.01. Yep. So this one is on uh, related to the prohibition of referral or assistance. And it is with respect to referring a student for a procedure. Um, and this, it, it just clarifies that this policy does not apply to employees, board members, and school officials who are parents or legal guardians of that student. So referring them to, for medical procedures um, is prohibited to the extent you are not the parent. But if you are the parent, you are not precluded from doing that. Thank you. Thank Mr. You. Johnson. Just in, um, when we say medical procedures, it's, do we... It's specific it's, to abortion. Okay. Thank you. So sort to of make sure everybody's yep. clear on what we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rich. I move that the Board of Education approve the expenditures as outlined in the expenditure printout dated November 19th, 2019, as follows. General Fund, $11,079,946. General Fund Athletics, $207,977. Nothing from the Debt Fund. Capital Projects, 2018 Bond Fund. 
$2,314,109. Nutrition Services Fund, $369,767. And the Benefit Stabilization Fund, which is $1,694,532, for a total of $15,666,331. Support. We have a motion to approve the expenditures as outlined in the expenditure printout dated November 19th, 2019 by Mr. Rich, supported by Mrs. Cummings. Any discussion? Mrs. Smith? Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Rich? Yes. Ms. Cummings? Yes. Ms. Weems? Yes. Mr. Mukamal? Yes. I myself, yes. Ms. Green? Yes. It passes. Thank you. Moving to consent agenda. Mr. McMill. I move that the Board of Education approve the November 19, 2019 consent agenda as follows. Uh, A, approval of minutes from the November 5, 2019 board workshop, November 6, study session, November 14, special meeting on capital funding options, November 14, special meeting closed session. B, the Head Start Director's monthly report. C, personnel items. Support. We have a motion by Mr. McMill, supported by Mr. Johnson, to approve the consent agenda dated November 19, 2019. Mrs. Smith? Mr. McMill? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Cummings? Yes. Mr. Rich? Yes. Ms. Weems? Yes. I myself, yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Pass. Thank you. Moving next to reports from board committees, beginning with Finance Facilities Committee, Mr. Rich. Well, I know Ms. Weems is going to be touching on this a little bit about from the Policy and Board Governance Committee uh, report, but moving these uh, committee reports earlier in the agenda uh, because the work done by the Finance and Facilities Committee has been presented uh, earlier tonight uh, with regards to the, what we've been working on with uh, the bond and figuring out what's next for the district. So that has been presented. This is Weems, Policy and Board Governance Committee. Yes, so the Policy Committee uh, met um, today and we agreed on our previous priorities, which were to um, review policies that are coming from our uh, legal team as recommended because they um, keep us in compliance. Uh, we also talked about, uh, as a priority, developing board protocols, board norms, and then we also talked a lot about uh, the priority around um, considering our policy philosophy, right? So um, how we um, either continue on with our more flexible policies or the more prescriptive method. And so the two um, firms that we've talked to so far are Neola and Luskin Albertson, Luskin Albertson being the firm that we currently use, Neola being a, a much more comprehensive, very detailed uh, set of policies. So we, we need to uh, continue to have those types of discussions because as we're reviewing um, opportunities for uh, review and new policies, um, I think it will be important for us to have the conversation about our philosophy first. Um, because we wouldn't want to uh, consider adopting new policy only for it to change if we decide on a different philosophy later on. Um, so what we want to do is we want to continue to hear from the board and the community uh, as it relates to things that we need to consider, but we definitely think it's important for us to have that philosophy conversation first before we start writing policy. That doesn't mean that we can't consider direction and come up with um, um, some initial thoughts as it relates to our policy, but in terms of writing new items, uh, with the exception of those that are required by law, we'll probably, you know, hold on that until we have the philosophy conversation. Uh, we did talk about um, uh, more specifically board protocols. There are several areas of board protocol, right, around communications and our meetings and committees and all that sort of stuff. We focused over the last two meetings around committees. 
I share it with the rest of the board what we thought were the key questions. I think we got through the vast majority of those key questions and have some recommendations for the board, but there are two areas that we still need to discuss, and that is around meetings and tele uh, the televising of meetings and the definition of meetings for purposes of um, open meetings versus uh, closed meetings in our committee structure specifically. So those things we'll have to noodle on before we come back to you. Uh, there are two different ways that we can come to you as it relates to board protocols. We can come to you in sections um, and prepare for you some suggestions around how we will approach meetings, how we will approach communications, how we will approach board development, um, or we can talk generally and then bring you a very comprehensive set of board protocols later on. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, the approach. Uh, I personally think that's going to be a lot to digest um, in total, so we'll have to give that some thought. But that's what we talked about today. I think we're making a lot of progress. We share with mm -hmm. you a timeline, um, and so far we're, we're uh, meeting that timeline, but it's, it's pretty aggressive. Thank you. I think just one comment I'll make is just the comment regarding moving reports from board committees as we have these action committees and function, it makes sense to move that up in the agenda mm -hmm. before action items so mm -hmm. that there's public comment opportunity exactly. as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that makes a lot of sense. So thank you. Okay, your know, next item is reports from board representatives. I'm going to begin with the um, MASB um, annual conference for leadership. There were four of us that went and attended and were delegates as well. So um, Mr. Mukamal, anything highlights you want to share from your learnings? Well, I think that, uh, I, you know, I submitted to the, uh, to you, Madam Chair, the, my, my reflections from the different uh, courses that I took and, and clinics. There, there were a couple of things in the clinics that really uh, struck me. The first was technology. Uh, the technology that is starting to be used in other districts includes virtual reality, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and um, these are very important technologies that our students will need to have as they graduate. And so that is something that I am going to be watching uh, on the Academic Excellence Committee as the curriculum plan comes up and we get to look at that. Uh, one of the areas I'll be paying particular attention to is that. The second was uh, the mental health clinic, which I know uh, there were several of us at that was of, of uh, prime importance, and there's a lot of emphasis by, that MASPI is putting into this as well as in our district. And um, the Be Nice initiative that was presented was quite compelling. I know, Dr. Herrera, you are familiar with it as well. And so um, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that uh, move forward uh, over time in our district. The only other uh, observation that I had that really sort of struck me at, at this conference was the, the importance of our operation as a board that, in, well, I'll make the general statement, the cohesion of a board and the ability of a board of education to work in collaboration with the superintendent and to work as a team would appear to be the most important, if not in the top two or three things, that ultimately results in a district moving forward in terms of academic accomplishment for students. And the, so our ability in this district uh, to do that, I think, is, is going to be uh, very important going forward. Thank you. And I think we're, we're on the way. Thank you. Mrs. Smith. I also, um, well, Several, uh, four of us were delegates. Um, we were there for, we weathered the storm. We all made <laughs> it up um, safely. And we were delegates to make sure that the policies for the state would be um, 
passed, I would say. Um, I also sat in on the mental health um, clinic, or you would call it. Um, I think as a district, we are um, we're spot on. Um, with Dr. Herrera knowing what the Be Nice um, initiative is, we also are doing something similar to that approach with our PTAs. Um, it's not our kids that we think that are our loners. It is our students that are in our marching bands that are popular, that our people are looking at are just, they're just real cool, fun kids. And um, so several, the three of us, Ms. Weems, myself, and Mr. Mukama, sat in on that um, um, I want to say clinic and got the information and brought back um, to look at the telltale signs of what can happen and what is going on with our students and listen, pay attention to um, what they're saying, um, watch their patterns and their body language and, you know, listen to their friends. Uh, Mr. Mukamal and myself also set in on um, actually how to pass a bond. And um, that was amazing to hear the bring back the information, which we already got tonight. Um, my last uh, session, uh, CBA class, was uh, diversity on generational di diversity, which was to look at our millennials here that are running for school board. So um, uh, you look at the <laughs> dynamics of the school board members that are have served on your boards. I had board members that were in their 70s and um, that have been on the boards um, 20, 30 years. And then you get the younger generations that come in and come on. And that generation, they want things now. No offense. Um, they want it now. They want it done their way and we're finding that it's working and it's working their way um, and they're encouraging us to have more millennials and uh, more board members such as Mr. Rich to run for these positions and seats but over and all that was pretty much what we came back with. Thank you. Mrs. Williams. Um, I found um, many of the sessions that I went to very helpful. Um, I also attended the elections um, campaigns um, session, which was around you know passing bonds and, and that sort of thing, which is relevant, obviously, to us because of the action that we took today. And one of the key takeaways was um, our responsibility for asking questions to gain clarity and enhance understanding. That is, above all, um, our most important responsibility was the message that I got out of that. Um, was very interested in the mental health um, piece. Uh, won't, you know, uh, um, repeat everything that's been said, but I do want to mention that um, I'm sure we're all aware that adolescence is a very tough time, you know, physically, emotionally, academically for students. And what we're finding is that that is exacerbated in today's time with social media and technology and peer pressure and all of those sorts of things. And what was really astounding to me was that 49% of adolescents meet the criteria for a mental health disorder. That was staggering to me. And four out of five are uh, likely depressed. Four out of five students, I'm sorry, four out of five students with severe depression are untreated. That's the statistic. Um, and that was also pretty startling to me. Uh, it, you know, got me thinking about our responsibility with respect to social and emotional health. And there was also a segment on that. Uh, and, you know, um, teaching sort of, you know, whole learning around both the academics and the emotional and social. And what was interesting was the return on investment that districts are seeing around um, evidence-based programs which provide for an $11 return, meaning there's uh, $11 saved for every $1 spent, and the savings are costs not incurred from interventions. Um, obviously, these mental health issues result in behavioral problems, and that is something that I think a lot of districts are facing. Um, what was also interesting was um, 
it, it's not just about mental health and solving social and emotional problems, but it's about helping students solve complex problems. And that it translates to very usable adult skills. So what was really um, interesting to me was that um, the social emotional uh, uh, component are the skills that 92% uh, of executives say are as equally important to them as the technical skills. So complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others, emotional intelligence, judgment, decision making, negotiation, cognitive stuff, and service orientation all uh, wrapped up in the social emotional uh, component. So um, those were things that I took away and had some next steps that maybe the board could think about. And I appreciate, uh, 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 President Green, you asking us to uh, reflect on what we did and share our learnings with the rest of the board. So that's what, what we've done. I'll pass mine down. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to try not to be repetitive, but um, I may on a couple of points. So um, the first session I attended um, was the board self-evaluation for continuous improvement, where we talked about the board assessment tool. Through that, just some of the highlights are the benefits of the self-assessment tool. Uh, it allows for self-reflection on our own behaviors as well as our colleagues. It improves decision-making as a board. It assists in identifying strengths and weaknesses as a board as a whole. And it provides a starting point for effective and productive goal setting. So that is something we've been talking about and I think something that we're going to be looking at um, moving forward that we will be doing a board self-assessment um, right after the new year. So, uh, as The next session I attended was culturally competent leaders. Um, one of the things that we talked about in that group was that it's very important that as board members and as community, we know and understand the demographics um, before we can communicate and serve them. It talked about that culturally proficient environments acknowledge both individual and group differences, that educators and students know that they are valued, that cultural profic proficiency is based on a clearly defined set of core values and principles that support policies, behaviors, attitudes, and structures that enable educators and the community to work effectively across the cultures and the students that they represent. Um, as we stated during the delegate assembly, all proposals and verbiage were approved and adopted by the delegates. I think that's important for you to know. Also then I attended creating systems to support social and emotional learning. It talked about that every child needs a relationship at school with at least one caring adult. Um, talked about how some schools and districts are going about that by making sure they take student list having kids identify who's that person in that building that means something to them that they can go to, that they can trust and be valued. And so it might be something that we want to look at within our own system is how do we make sure every student has a caring adult in their life in our schools. I then went to Student Voice, who's sitting on your education table. This was a session that was kind of near and dear to me because I value Student Voice and and um, how do we bring that to us? Um, so it talked about, again, student voice being valuable. What opportunities do we have in place for student voice to be heard, valued, and impact our system? And then it was talking specifically about having board representatives, one or two students on the Board of Education without voting rights, but they would actually be a part of the, the board team. So that's something that we can also look about at and consider as we move forward. Next one I attended was codes of ethics and conduct. Big piece of message was eyes in, hands out. Um, staff carries out the policy set by the board. A code provides structure and an opportunity to discuss a problem. Then the be nice, I'm not going to um, expound too much on that, but be nice really hit me. It was suicide prevention, but it was complementary to like our Farmington Safe. It was more specific to helping to empower our students in our buildings. Um, Be Nice stands for Notice, Invite, Challenge, and Empower. Um, it was likened to the stop, drop, and roll of mental health um, education. It teaches that how you treat someone can have a direct impact on how they feel, think, and act about themselves. 
Um, and I think the powerful piece about this was it's an educational program that creates awareness and ultimately saves lives. So um, I have already shared the program with all of you. I gave you literature on it as well as um, shared it with our student roundtable who was super excited and probably going to engage in, in looking into it um, and having a speaker come in. So. And then the last one I'm going to talk about was board leadership, overcoming obstacles. They talked about the role of the Board of Education is to represent all students, not solely special groups or interests. The only behavior that we're able to change is our own behavior. The vision keeps the students as the focus of the work. Um, focus should always be on achievement. We have to be prepared for our board meetings and maintain a professional conduct at the board meetings. Communicate through the chair. And remember, above all, it's all about the children. Overall, it was a fabulous, fabulous time of learning. Um, we did practice our counting on the way back. We counted over 40 accidents about every half mile as we were coming home. But we were very thankful after almost two incidents with snowplows that we made it back here for these reports. <laughs> and Ms. Green, um, we also were informed that um, the legislation is looking into making um, your board members certified. Um, that will probably be going into place soon, that all board members will, it will be mandatory that board members are certified. So um, that's not much for us, because majority of us are here are certified board members. And I'll just um, jump down to that one. One specific area they want to certify board members in is understanding and being able to read and use data to guide decision making. So currently, you can become data certified through MASB, through MASB. And the conversation ensued that if you were already certified, you would not be grandfathered in and therefore have to be recertified. So the conversation became as, as the legislature looks at in parting these, how will the funding support for districts who've already paid to have board members certified? How will you be recertified? And will there be funding to support that? So, thank you. Moving to Mr. Muckamel with an update from PTA. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, a couple of announcements. Tomorrow, uh, the film Resilience will be shown and a discussion will ensue. It will be held at the Maxfield Education Center on Ten Mile Road. Uh, this is open to the public. Uh, I know that we received as a board, we did receive uh, an email uh, advising us about that. Um, unfortunately, I can't attend because there's a conflict. If you don't have a conflict and if you are available, it really would be worthwhile attending this. It, it talks about adverse childhood experiences and how we overcome that. The second item, uh, December 3rd, there is uh, Alice training for parents. Uh, it's Tuesday, December 3rd from 7 to 8.30 p.m., also at the Maxfield Education Center. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to clarify, too, that the conflict tomorrow involves many of the board members as we had previously registered to attend Oakland County School Board Association's um, session on opiates and vaping, which is another very important topic here in our, in our system. So um, if you're not attending that and av available, please um, go in and see resilience if you're able. So, okay, thank you. Mrs. Weems, Head Start. So Head Start um, had an audit which completed last <coughs> week. Uh, there were no areas of noncompliance with the 2019 fiscal monthly uh, protocols. Uh, the director there does a great job with the program and monitoring of the budget. So great job to Head Start. Thank you. Any, Mr. Mr. Johnson? Right. <laughs> I Just want to remind uh, students and anyone who can tutor that uh, at Maxfield on Saturday, uh, starting at 9 a.m. till about noon, uh, go out, get free tutoring. Uh, again, that's sponsored through FAPN, and uh, we'd love to see a full house there. Thank you. We heard an update tonight from Student Roundtable, but I just wanted to add a couple of things. Speaking about tutoring, they are setting up a schedule. They're going to divide and conquer, and uh, we're setting up a calendar where they will be able to 
sign up and be part of the Saturday tutoring um, for um, that as well. In addition, I want to thank um, the STEAM Academy and especially Mr. Card. Uh, we made our members of the roundtable official. They all now have officially um, have name tags that were um, laser engraved and they got to go in and see how that happens. And so uh, they're pretty excited to have their names at the table um, as an actual function. In addition to that, I want to thank Mrs. Buckley for the support she gives to the round table and has been giving them um, to make sure that they have an agenda, they're prepared, they know what's happening, and she's done a great job putting that together, so I want to thank her for that. We also um, helped design an action planning sheet that will help guide them so that they know who's doing what, by when, and what it is they're accomplishing. So um, we're working on a little bit more structure to make sure that their voices are actually valid and heard, and uh, we have a format to make sure that they they have that opportunity. So lots of good things happening with Roundtable. So Dr. Herrera, I think we're ready to move to superintendent announcements. Are you tired yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy listening to the group tonight. Yeah. Um, just, just one update, and I just want to thank the board for their time on, on Saturday as we, we worked as a little team building or about um, uh, getting updates from me in terms of things that we'll be looking at um, over the next or for the remainder of the school year. Um, but um, listening to the board and, and uh, the, the sessions you were, had an opportunity to attend um, at uh, the MASPE conference, just would like to, to say that, um, as you know, coming into the district, um, we've been doing a lot of work on systems, um, you know, the organizational chart piece, roles and responsibilities, and, and getting, getting those things in place, um, working on finishing up the bond. Um, and again, uh, Mr. Reby has been very helpful in that. Um, getting my hands around the budget, got to thank Mrs. Kaminsky because we're, we're already into budget development, an amendment, and then getting into budget development for next year. So a lot of management things we've been working on, um, as you know, also with, uh, you know, planning to doing our prep work on um, the, this new bond proposal and the new bond campaign and, and what that will look like. So from, from my perspective on it, I'm very much looking forward to um, conversations that reflect some of the things you were just talking about. Um, in, in, in reconnecting with our strategic plan in that process and, and, and seeing how it evolves over the next uh, four to six months um, because we, we can talk a lot about, you know, making sure our buildings are safe and secure and, and that we have um, the climate controls in place so they're appropriate and supportive of student learning. But what we do with the students during that time, I think, is, is a conversation we haven't had enough of. So when I hear you talk about these things, what comes to mind is, is where we're at with our more, we've been more for teacher-centered to student-centered um, type classroom environments. Where are we at with really with our technology integration? Mm -hmm. And at what level have we integrated our technology into the student learning? So how does technology actually support our instructional deliveries and our curriculum, not just being used as a device? Also, where are we at with our real world, real world connections? And how are we making our, our learning more relevant to students? And we know we can do that through more project-based and inquiry-based learning opportunities and connecting them to real world projects. Um, and last but not least, um, we, we also talk about um, in the end, what this all boils down to is how we're personalizing the learning environment for each student so that we can develop those relationships with them, gain a deep understanding of what their needs are, and then begin to support them on the social, emotional, and learning um, competencies while, while also addressing all their individual learning needs. So in other words, um, considering what it would be like to move away from this traditional time-bound um, learning experience that we've all had into more personalized learning because we know students learn in different ways and at different rates and in different paces. So, you know, some of that is, is you know, I talk about, you know, sometimes we have to learn new things. Um, sometimes we have to unlearn things that, mm -hmm. we've been, that we've been practicing in the past. And, um, and then, so what does this look like? And I think as we begin to talk about these things, I see the excitement you have about, you know, the be nice and, and, mm -hmm. and some of the tech integration and, and these other aspects of learning and better use of data and, and on and on. Um, I think we, we begin to have those discussions and, and take a look at what that means to the district in a comprehensive 
um, fashion as we move through the strategic planning. So, um, like I said, we're looking very much towards those future conversations with the board and, and going through the strategic plan planning process to really talk about what this learner profile looks like, what, what you know experiences and knowledge and skills do we want our students leaving Farmington Public Schools with, and how we're developing all the supports in, in creating those learning environments that will lead to those outcomes. So um, here we go. Uh, we, we get to take a, a one, one new twist in, this, um, in these conversations, but um, I think that's where it gets very exciting, and that's where we begin to engage much more with the community and our staff and, and our students. Thank you. Preview. Now the preview. December 17th, we're right back again at uh, the study session in our regular meeting. Um, at that meeting, we, we do have an opportunity to recognize some of our teachers that earn national board certification. We will um, recognize an NCTM board member as well. And um, then we'll come back again once again with some policy updates and, and, and recommendations from the policy committee. And then we will bring some closure to the, the lengthy discussions we had regarding my performance over the past couple of weeks. So <laughs> um, we'll look forward to, uh, to item number four as well. Thank you. Moving to the next item, recommendations for future agenda items. <coughs> Seeing none, moving to good and welfare. Mr. Johnson. Uh, this will be our last meeting prior to Thanksgiving. I just want everybody to have a happy, safe Thanksgiving. And uh, yes, indeed. let's be thankful and extend some love and kindness to other folks out there who may need it, even though they, you may think they don't, but they may need it. So thank you. Mrs. Smith. Um, tomorrow night is the Oakland School Board, Board of Association meetings with all of the tri-county area of Oakland, well, Oakland School Boards. Um, as many of you know, I sit on that committee. Um, as Ms. Green said, we will be discussing opioids and vaping. Vaping is a huge, huge problem. We're hearing parents say, I'd rather them smoke vape than to smoke cigarettes, but they're both just as bad. So I will be bringing back information to um, the board as well as to our PTA who has been working diligently on this uh, op this whole thing with vaping. Um, also, have a very happy and safe Thanksgiving as we've been discussing um, Be Nice uh, with the suicide prevention. We know that we lost a young man while we were in Traverse City, um, I'd rather not mention names, and it was a family friend. Um, suicide is big, and it's huge around these holidays. So we have to look out not only for our young, but for our, for our elderly. So if you know someone that doesn't have anybody, or just pick up the phone and call and just say, hey, how are you, or just go by. So let's be you know, diligent and look out for those that may not have anybody and have a safe Thanksgiving. Mr. Rich. Well, first I want to echo the, uh, the comments made by my board colleagues. Um, the holidays are uh, an especially hard time for a lot of people. Uh, and so as we're going into that time, please remember to be safe. The roads are getting ice here. Um, luckily, we have a great Department of Public Works here in Farmington, Farmington Hills, but please be on the lookout. Um, there are a lot of people now back in town for the holidays who might not be using their best judgment, so just please be careful. We want to see everyone uh, when we get into this new year. So, um, please have a relaxing little break over Thanksgiving and be ready to come back strong in December, finish out the semester strong. Um, and then I just wanted to give a quick thank you uh, to our three Cub Scouts who are here uh, this, this evening uh, from Cub Scout Den 3 of PAC 389, which meets at Forest Elementary. Uh, they were here earlier to talk to uh, me, and I was able to bring in um, some other board members and, part and members of our administration uh, because they were starting to look at civil engagement and 
finding ways that they can get involved. And so thank you to Graham Kosiba, uh, Elijah Pastor, and Felix Yesian for coming in tonight uh, and leading us in the pledge and talking with me. And I look forward to seeing all of the things that you're going to be doing in the future. And I'm just going to close out with, um, I received an invitation from the Farmington Farmington Hills um, Foundation to serve on the grant, grant allocation committee. So I will be serving on that to help siphon through all of those grants and, and uh, find out how we're going to do this. So. Um, and I also just want to also give a shout out to Farmington High School. Um, I had the opportunity to attend the recent play, You Can't Take It With You. It was fabulous. Um, they did an amazing job. Thank you to the Cobbs um, for coming over and, and taking on Farmington High and sharing their gifts and talents with the students. It was really beneficial. And they're already prepared and ready for the Adams Family as their musicals. So lots to look forward to. Thank you. Um, we will now move to so the moved. adjourn. <laughs> there is a motion by Mr. Johnson, seconded by Mrs. Weems for adjournment. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Have a wonderful evening. All right.